another attack in the future to thwart those that are underway right now. Um, no man, no matter what position he sits in, is above the law. No, no one is too powerful for our system of justice. Um, and I want to make sure that this investigation follows those facts as, as far as they go, as high up as they lead. And at the end of the day, we have justice and we preserve uh, the single most powerful force um, that humankind has invented, and that's democracy, to, to bring forward the, the power, the ingenuity, the creativity of an entire nation, especially given the challenges that we have now. This democracy has never been under this kind of attack. And one of the ways that, that we can protect this democracy going forward is to have the truth, to have the facts about what happened, and to have the accountability and the justice that, that necessarily must follow. We got to head in. Are you getting oh, sick? Go. We're going to no, just being on the road for, for eight days. <laughs> just talking a lot. Okay. Okay. I, I won't, I won't do that. Thank you for the warning. Hello. Thank you for being here. Hi. Thank you for coming out. Yeah, appreciate it. Hi. That's O'Rourke. Nice to meet you. Caitlin, who's this? Caleb. Caleb, nice to meet you. How are you? How old? He is Four. Four. Yes. Well, he answered that for you. Yeah. And pre-existing conditions are... You're about are... to be five? Yeah. Right on. And so are you about to start kindergarten or are you already in kindergarten? Uh, I, I am. You're in kindergarten? Right on. So I, my youngest is Henry and he's in second grade and he says it just gets better from, from where you are. So um, first grade, second grade, next, it's going to be awesome. I'm so glad I got to meet you. Thank right. you for coming out. Are you going to be able to join us inside? We're going to try. Okay. But pretty good same conditions are our voting struggle right now. Absolutely. Because without that, without Obamacare, we would have coverage. Thank you for sharing that and, and really reminding us of what's on the line and why this election is so important. Thank you for making the time. Thank and you. Me to Caleb. Buddy, nice to meet you. Do you know how to blow it up? Boom. Yeah. <laughs> I like that. Thank you, bud. Thank you so much Thank for you. being here. I'm Carolina, our first visit to the state, our first morning on the campaign trail here. I mean, in Rock Hill, we are thankful to be here. And the whole campaign and the whole country to see, but we're grateful to be here now. Good Thank you. Let me Thank have you that very much. Show that. Show that. Yes. <laughs> I got you. You got it? Yeah, you're good. Go. 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 Where do you want him to speak? He's leading him in. All right. Yep. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you for having us out. Thank you. Thank you. Veterans for better. Yeah. I like that. I like that. That's over veterans. Okay. All right. All right. Okay. You got Mayor, are you kicking us off? I'll be happy okay. to. You don't have to. You don't have to. <laughs> All right. Oh, my goodness. I want to fight someone to we'll this good town full of these good people. And notice he has a lapel pin on that will make you all happy in Rock Hill. <laughs> Beto O'Rourke. All right. Been on the trail now for eight days. <laughs> all of eight days. <laughs> at, at events like these, all over back. Iowa nice and Wisconsin and Ohio and Pennsylvania, New Hampshire, every single county in New Hampshire, 
Now, if, I said that, if I said that in Texas where there are 254 counties, you would be impressed. But 10, 10 counties in New Hampshire getting to meet the very people whom I wish to serve by first listening to them, learning from them, understanding the challenges and opportunities that we face as a country from the perspective of those who are living them, who understand them, and who want to share them with me, regardless of party affiliation, regardless of geography, regardless of race or faith or gender or sexual orientation. This country, this country more divided than I have ever seen it in my lifetime, confronts a set of challenges absolutely unprecedented in our history. From millions of Americans not being able to see a doctor or afford their prescriptions even when they have, even when they have insurance, to parents who live with the fear that a child with a pre-existing condition will no longer be eligible for coverage or be able to get the medication or the equipment or the therapy that can allow them to lead their lives to the fullest and in some cases to be able to lead their lives at all. We live in a country where this economy works too well for too few. The concentration of power and wealth and privilege we have not seen in the lifetime of anyone in this country. You'd have to go back more than 100 years to see another Gilded Age like this one. In the same way that that last concentration provoked a progressive response that ensured that we made the investments in one another, that we had political democracy because we had something approaching economic democracy, we must now make sure that we invest in people, not corporations, in communities, not special interests. <laughs> are paid a living wage Amen. that these heroic school teachers yeah. 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 and educators, those who have the most important job, that child, their lifelong love of learning with that teacher and that educator can unlock, but if she's working two, three jobs just to make ends meet and provide food and housing for her own child, it's gonna be hard for her to do that. We have a challenge for the entire human race, in every country on this planet, the scientists beyond the shadow of a doubt tell us that thanks to our own excesses, our own emissions, our own inaction, this planet has warmed one degree Celsius over pre-industrial revolution levels just since 1980. Let us know. The California, the floods in Nebraska and Iowa, the 58 oh, yeah. inches of rain, I wish this microphone was connected to a speaker. Uh, <laughs> 58 inches of rain, thank you. <laughs> the 58 inches of rain that fell from the sky in Houston, Texas, which was the greatest amount in recorded history in the United States, and was also the third 500 year flood in just the last five years years, the droughts through which our farmers and our ranchers and our producers persist. Though those droughts will become more frequent, more devastating, more profound, will undermine our ability to grow our own food and fiber, to feed and clothe not just the United States, but so much of the rest of the world. Those scientists also tell us we have 12 years within which to act, and given the gravity of the consequences. This kind of devastation and natural disasters and death and suffering that we endure right now will only become worse and it will become much worse unless we take action. We cannot meet it by half measures or by half the country. This cannot be a Democratic or a Republican Party solution. It can't be big cities versus small towns. It is this country. one of these beautiful children that I have met today. I want my three kids, Ulysses, Molly, and Henry. I want 
every single generation to come to know, to believe, and to see that they have a future in this country, that they will have economic opportunity. That they will be well enough to succeed. They'll have every single opportunity to unleash and reveal their genius, their potential, their promise in this, the greatest country that humankind has ever known. But if we are to do this, we must fix our democracy, which is also the greatest mechanism that humankind has ever invented to unleash this potential, especially given the challenges that we face. That means not only that each of us must vote, we must register the people in our lives to vote as well. We must acknowledge that some people today functionally cannot vote. In Texas, before 2018, we ranked 50th in the country in voter turnout. Not because we love our democracy any less than anybody else, but we were drawn that way by a state legislature that because of your race or your ethnicity or your country of national origin drew you out of a congressional district ensure that your vote counted for a little bit less than someone else's, therefore drew you out of that reason to vote out of your very democracy. We have to acknowledge a criminal justice system in this country that has produced the largest prison population in the world. Disproportionately. Disproportionately comprised of people of color, so many there for nonviolent drug crimes, and though Americans of all races and ethnicities consume illegal drugs at the same rate, only some are more likely than others to be arrested, to serve time, to check a box on an employment application form, so that they will not get that drug, will no longer be able to apply for a federally subsidized student loan, so they will not obtain higher education. Not only is this grossly unfair, and hugely expensive. But we are losing out on the potential of everything that every incarcerated man and woman, more likely than not of color, is supposed to do in their time on this planet. The jobs they can work, the families they can raise, the poetry that they are going to compose, the great things that they're going to do in positions of elected leadership and trust. We would be the beneficiaries if we could get this right just now, I had the honor of meeting Willie McLeod, one of the Friendship Nine, who took me to the very seat that he occupied at a lunch counter that refused to serve him solely based on the color of his skin in the living lifetime of so many people in this room and in this country. It was his courage and the other eight members of the Friendship Nine who willingly got arrested, refused to post bail, stayed in those jail cells for 30 days, experienced the indignity visited upon them, not for themselves, but for everybody else in this country. Their example, that model, their inspiration affords us an opportunity to do the right thing when we too are confronted with this moment of truth. I want to make sure. I want to make sure that when the people of the future, our kids and grandkids and their kids and grandkids are looking back on us in South Carolina on this day of March 2019, they look back with pride and gratitude. They knew the challenges that we faced and we were not found wanting and we delivered for them together united united states of america that's why i'm running to serve you as the next president so, so grateful to be here with you my gratitude especially to mayor geddes and his family to council member jackson to Mr. McLeod, to Bishop Crump, to everybody who showed us South Carolina hospitality and has made us feel at home on day one of this campaign in your great state. Thank you for having us out here. I want to make sure. Hey. Madison, 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 Madison,
家的事Time zone, a state long thought to be too conservative for any Democrat to contend, and certainly if you wanted to run statewide, you had to trim your sails. You could not have the luxury of the courage of your convictions. You had to pick some moderate middle of the road path. And as Jim Hightower, our former commissioner of agriculture in Texas, said, the only thing that you'll find in the middle of the road are yellow lines and dead armadillos. <laughs> So in this state that had become the epicenter of the maternal mortality crisis, three times as deadly for women of color, we proudly and boldly talked about health care, meaning among primary mental and specialty health care, every woman makes her own decisions about her own body. <laughs> suffered the massacre at Santa Fe High School and so many other shootings in churches and schools in day-to-day -day life so common it didn't even make the headlines far too often didn't even make the nightly news we talked about gun violence followed the lead of the very youngest among us who led the school walkouts who led the marches for our lives those moms who demand action and not <laughs> Learning from those moms who shared with me that states that have adopted universal background checks have seen a near 50% reduction in gun violence. We wanted to make sure that from our proud gun-owning state, where we see it as a responsibility for which we are accountable to use that firearm for hunting, for self-defense, for sport, for collection, whatever it is, but to use it responsibly. That we also agree, and we campaigned on this, that weapons designed, engineered, and sold to the United States military for the express purpose of killing people as effectively, as efficiently, and as great a number as possible should not be sold any longer in And lastly, lastly, in our state, which like yours, struggles with a schoolhouse to jailhouse pipeline, one that begins not in high school, one that begins when you're five years old in the kindergarten classroom, where if you are a child of color, you stand up to five times the likelihood of being disciplined, suspended, or expelled as a white student in the same classroom. We talked about not only, not only funding those heroic public school teachers commensurate yes. with their values so they're working one job, we talked about making sure that we hire 
and retain teachers who look like the students in their classrooms. We talked about, we talked about ending a war on drugs has become a war on people and some people over others, not only ending the prohibition on marijuana, yeah. but expunging the arrest records of everyone arrested for possession. Yeah. And then, we traveled to every single one of the 254 counties of Texas with the same message, no matter how red or rural, no matter how blue or urban, we wanted to make sure that we persisted with the courage of our convictions, and though we came up a little bit short, 2.6%, if you are counting, <laughs> we absolutely changed the face and complexion of politics and democracy in Texas. We went from 50th in the country in voter turnout to having a 500% increase in young voters. <laughs> Representative seats, the U.S. House of Representatives, long held by Republicans, long thought not to be competitive, now held by Democrats. And in Houston, Texas, Harris County, not only our largest city, but the most diverse city in the entire United States of America, 17 African American women in November of 2018 won judicial positions of authority. <laughs> so, yes, not only will we campaign this way, we will serve in this way, and we will do so in a way that brings as much of this country together around these progressive policies. Thank you for the you, and then I'm going to come back to you. Thank you. This is a question about dreamers, yes. our fellow Americans in any way that matters. More than one million who came to this country at a very young age and who now face the prospect and live under the fear of deportation back to a country they do not know, whose language more likely than not they do not speak, where they will not have family, and where, if against those long odds, they are successful, they'll be successful for that place. Not Rock Hill, not South Carolina, not the United States of America. Not only are those dreamers in our classrooms, those dreamers are teaching in our classrooms. Not only are those dreamers defended by the brave women and men serving all over the world in our armed forces, those dreamers are serving all over the world in our armed forces. In El Paso, Texas, more than 100 years ago, this guy, Marcelino Serna, immigrated to our community from Chihuahua. Undocumented immigrant, coming here for opportunity or to join his family. This country entered the First World War. He entered the United States Army. His drill sergeant said, Serna, every man in this unit is going to France, but not every man in this unit will return home. You're not a citizen. This isn't your fight. And of course, like any good American, Serna said, no way, I'm going to France. Came back the most highly decorated veteran from the state of Texas in all of the world. While some, while some are proposing building a 2,000 mile, 30 foot high, $30 billion wall, which if you know your geography will not be built on the international boundary line, which is the center channel of the Rio Grande River. It will be built well into the interior of our country, forcing you and me to take our fellow Americans' ranches and farms and homes for a wall that we do not need at a time of record safety and security along the U.S.-Mexico border. Here's how we get safer and better. One, free every single dreamer from any fear of deportation by making them U.S. citizens. <laughs> do, do not do that. Do not do that at the cost of a wall or at the price of deporting their parents, the original dreamers, understand that there are millions here, some of whom have been here for decades, making our community stronger, making our country better, and making the United States safer. El Paso, Texas, my hometown, 
one half of the largest binational community in the hemisphere. A quarter of those with whom we live, born somewhere else, call to us. Their very presence makes us stronger, more successful, and yes, safer. El Paso, one of the safest cities yes. in the United States. Si queremos asegurar nuestras comunidades, necesitamos tratar ya dos personas. First off, I want to say uh, I'm a veteran for, for Beto. Se secondly, uh, half of this country, or more than half, is, uh, are female women. What would a Beto cabinet look like, and what about a, a female vice president? Great question. <laughs> Gentlemen, Sarah, right. he's, he's a veteran for Beto. I told him when I walked in, I'm Beto for veterans. Right. <laughs> if we think about the service provided by the men and women, served in World War II in Korea, in Vietnam, who are serving right now in wars that are going on 18 years in Afghanistan, 27 years in Iraq, through six successive presidential administrations. The trillions of dollars that we have spent in their readiness, in the bombs and the missiles and the bullets, in their pay, and yet we shirk our obligations when they return to this country. 49,000 funded, authorized, but unfilled positions within the VA, 20 veterans a day, every day, taking their lives, 16 of those 20 unable or unwilling to get into the VA. I connect that with the understaffing, the under-resourced, and the fact that it has not been a priority for this country. If we express it through our actions, our funding, and our outcomes, I wanna make sure that every single American willing to put their life on the line, does not have to wait in a line to see a mental health care provider for their PTSD, does not have to wait in line to get that health care provider, does not have to stand on the street corner begging for money because they do not have a roof over their head. If we have the resources, as the wealthiest, the most powerful country on the planet, to wage these wars everywhere and all the time, then certainly we must have the resources to care for those who have borne the battle. This other question, Yes. about the, the extraordinary talent, potential, uh, and leadership that we're seeing all across this country from every walk of life and every background. Gentleman mentions that more than half of us are women in this country. How will that be reflected in the way that I campaign and the way in which I serve? Our leadership in this campaign is comprised largely of women, for which I am grateful. Many women of color in some of our leading positions, ensuring that we reflect the true genius of this country. Those who are at the forefront of the most important battles, they are going to be at the forefront of this campaign. And in our administration, every single position of trust will be reflective of this country. I want our administration to look like our country. And so we will make sure that that is the case going forward. Thank you for the question. We have time for two more. Yes, ma'am. Okay, so my community and I lost Alyssa Al Hadaf in the shooting at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School last year. And as a Jewish high school student, I want to know what concrete steps you're going to make me safe in school and make me safe in my temple. Thank you. Thank you for the questions. I am sorry for your losses. I'm sorry that this country loses more than 30,000 of our fellow Americans every year because we have failed to form the political will necessary to make these changes because it is not our lot in life to experience this kind of tragedy. There's nothing inherently violent or evil or wrong with the United States. This is not an act of God or an act of nature. This is a consequence of a human-based problem that lacks a human-based solution until we take action. Because you are standing up today, because you've stood up before the House of Representatives for the first time in a decade, passed meaningful gun safety reform, universal background checks, whatever its prospects in the Senate. And before President Trump, it is an important step in the right direction. And we got there not because of those in elected positions, though they are my friends and I used to be described as one. We got there, we got there because of you and others who demanded and forced that change. Lyndon Baines Johnson is not the primary person responsible for the Civil Rights Act or the Voting Rights Act. Though he signed them, though he used his legislative prowess to force those through the Senate, really, it was those who organized, who sat at those lunch counters, who gave their lives in the civil rights struggle that forced and produced that change. So I'm confident that on those measures that we just described, 
universal background checks, a ban on military weapons that are sold into our communities, ideas that I've heard from those who have survived these school shootings like locker laws and red flag laws to make sure that if you are a danger to yourself, you're a danger to someone else in your life, we go through a sober, deliberative process to ensure that you and those around you are safe. All of that is part of it. But there are some other steps as well. The largest mental, mental health care provider in the state of Texas is the county jail system in the state of Texas. People with schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, depression, literally throwing a chair through a window to get arrested on purpose because that county jail is the one place where they're guaranteed food and clothing, a roof over their head, a prescription to a psychotropic medication that momentarily makes life bearable for them before they are once again out on the streets. Incredibly expensive, $110 a night in Houston, Texas to take care of someone. For a fraction of that cost, we can provide consistent, preventative mental health care to every single American. And then this last most important point, you mentioned your membership in the temple. We think about the massacre at the Tree of Life Synagogue. We think about the fact that in this country for three years counting, there has been a rise in hate crimes. The rhetoric and the language that we use has real consequences in the lives that are affected. If it's that third grade girl that we met in El Paso, who because she is Mexican American asked us, why does my president not like me? Or when I tell that story in Houston and the parents of a Muslim girl who's in the third grade say, their daughter said the very same thing. And we have to wonder what it does to those girls' conceptions of themselves, their future in this country, whether they belong here at all, we have to wonder if the Islamophobia, calling Mexicans rapists and criminals, trying to ban all Muslim travel to the United States, calling Klansmen and white supremacists and neo-Nazis very fine people, what it is doing to this country right now. I'll tell you what, on the day that the president signed his executive order in 2017, seeking to ban Muslim travel to the United States, a mosque in Victoria, Texas was burned to the ground. We need to have a president who reflects the true genius of this country, that we are a people of the planet. Every single one of us, every single one of us owed deserving respect of being heard, of being listened to, and the very best brought forward from them. Not to be denigrated or put down, marginalized or shoved aside. That's who we are when we are at our best, bringing everyone together and expecting the very best from us so that all of those things in my mind are connected. Thank you for asking the question. Yes, ma'am. I work at the ACLU, and I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about what your stance is and how you intend to change the cash bail system that you yourself benefited from. Great question, great question. <laughs> Thank you, and thank you for your work with the ACLU. As you probably know, your colleagues in El Paso and along the border are doing absolutely heroic work in the face of cruelty and inhumanity visited upon our fellow human beings and our fellow Americans at the border. I'm grateful. Um, she alludes to the fact that I've been arrested twice in my life. <laughs> Both serious offenses, once uh, more than 20 years ago for attempted criminal trespass, the other far more serious and far more grave a mistake driving under the influence of alcohol, drunk driving to put a, a point to it. In both instances I was arrested, in both instances I spent a night in the county jail, and in both instances I was able to post bail because we had the resources in our family to do that. I understand now how exceptional my experience was and the fact that these mistakes didn't define me or my future or my options over the course of my lifetime. That's right. And now there are so many people in this country who because their families cannot post bail, are unable to get out of jail. There are so many people, I mentioned these nonviolent drug offenses, who will check a box on every employment application form, who will never be able to qualify for a student loan, who cannot vote in too many of the counties of our states right now. So ending the cash bail system makes sense. You cannot be too poor to have your freedom, and that is exactly what happens in the United States of America today. So, thank you for is that it? so I'm, I'm being told that that is the last question. Thank you for having us out. Look forward to coming back. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
excuse me. You come in for a second. Thank you. <laughs> Stay back, y'all. Do not throw it. Do not throw it, y'all. Back up. We need to, we need to open it. Yep. We're going to open it. Yep. 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 Yep